everybody. I'm Steve. Yeah, uh, things are complicated. So I'm on the Ruby on Rails team. I have a Rails tattoo, uh, or a Ruby tattoo. I just took a job at a Python shop. So I'm like doing more Python stuff now. Uh, I've been doing like research into hypermedia and API design for the last couple of years. Um, I wrote a book on that. I'm really heavily involved in Mozilla's new Rust programming language. Um, yeah, I travel a lot. So there are, if you're not a Ruby programmer, there are a lot of Ruby conferences. There's something like 60 a year. And it just so happens that like they all accepted my CFPs. You know, you're like, you don't expect to get in. So you submit to like every conference. And then unfortunately they all say yes. And you're like, oh no, now I have to fly on planes all the time. So um, I'm super happy to be back in Paris. I love it here. I want to live here someday. Uh, even though I don't currently speak French, I want to learn at some point because it's mega embarrassing that I only speak English, LOL, uh, the United States. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk to you today about uh, JSON API and also specifically about conventions-driven API development. Um, so yeah, I, luckily, like we said, yeah, I'm super big into openness, and so this is like a big theme of this talk and was for my talk last year. So luckily, because I don't tend to use proprietary anything, um, I use HTML for my slides, so when my Chromebook did not work on the projector. It's just a matter of loading up the uh, URL for the presentation, and it's all online. So I also tweeted a link to it if you want to follow along. OK, so enough meta shenanigans. Let's, let's get into it. Um, so like I said, I've been doing Ruby really heavily for the last couple years, but my new job uh, is at a Python shop, which is awesome. Like I love Python, too. But Python and Ruby, uh, while they are very similar programming languages, have almost totally divergent philosophical approaches to writing software, right? So um, if you are not mega familiar, um, I'm not going to talk about this too much more, but basically the Zen of Python says that explicit is always better than implicit. It's like one of the core things that Pythonistas like, uh, are enjoy about their programming language and the libraries they build. Rails is built on this feature called convention over configuration. So the idea is that if you follow conventions, you don't have to worry about writing out tons of configuration files. It just assumes that you want to do the normal happy thing and then just works. So I'm really conflicted because I like both of these things at the same time. And while I'm not a big fan of the notion of absolute truth in general, I figure there's got to be some way to like reconcile these two viewpoints with each other. Um, so, so part of this presentation is about like how do we combine these two different ways of looking at the world because they're actually kind of the same thing in certain ways, um, even though they seem opposed at the beginning. So when I make a, an HTTP request to a web page, right? Like this is a very simple request, right? Get to the slash with this host header. This is like HTTP 1.1, right? How does my browser know, or how does my client, whatever client I'm using, um, know how to display the response that comes back? Basically. Uh, if you would use curl and just inspect the headers, the response you would get back, this one of the headers that you get back um, is called content type. And this is one of the uh, headers that I cared least about through most of my like, career as a web developer. But for the last two years, this is a header that I probably care about the most, more than almost everything. Um, there's a long and really interesting history of how this header came to be. It actually happens because of emails. Um, Sure, this is a good story, so I'll tell it. So uh, the original email specification said that emails were a maximum of 10,000 ASCII characters. And so um, they thought that you know while they built that, and that was like, great for the first uh, period of time, some people were not very happy, right? Because ASCII, while it's great for good old people from America, uh, you know, the rest of the world uses non-ASCII characters. So this is like unfortunate. So um, the, the, but, it actually didn't even come from the multilingual thing. That was a backport. So the original way of getting around, like the people who wanted to get around the 10,000 ASCII character limit was I, I envision a future. Um, I, I always forget these people's names. There's like two guys who spearheaded this effort um, in IETF back in the early 80s. So they said like, all right, email is text only now, but someday I'm going to have grandkids and I'm going to live far away from them and I want to send them a photos of what's going on with myself. And like, I want my son to send me a picture of my grandkids. So we need a way to get images into emails because like this is ridiculous. Everybody laughed at these two people. Like when they went to the IETF meeting that year, everybody laughed and they said, emailing photos to people? What are you, an idiot? Um, which sounds really funny now, but back then they were, you know, it was like totally different universe, right? So um, 
so they went back and they said, okay, this is not going to work. So how can we figure out how to do it? So they came up with the like multilingual uh, justification the next year. And they said, oh, email is not going to work for people that do not use ASCII character sets. So we need to come up with a way of sending emails and things that are not just ASCII. And people said, oh, that's an important use case. So they invented this thing called Multimedia Internet Mail Extensions, or MIME. And so um, part of that was adding this little bit of metadata that specified what kind of content you were sending so that you could send multiple kinds of content. So when it came time for the web, originally you know, people just assumed HTML, but once we started doing multimedia things on the web, they stole the multimedia stuff from email and started using these different called, things called content types to determine what it is. So the content type header tells you what comes back. Um, so after that really long-winded discussion, just getting a simple web page is actually really complicated and has a lot of history. Um, and so we have a number of media types that have been developed since. Like, you know, I'm sure you're all big fans of text plane and text HTML and especially application JSON, but also there's other ones like image ping and like image JPEG. There are a couple hundred of these that are, um, you know, registered with the IANA. Um, but so how can we reconcile the Zen of Python with convention over configuration? And um, what I realize is that media types are the synthesis of these two ideas. So media types are about standardizing upon some sort of conventions. We all agree that we are going to process some sort of format in this particular way, but uh, even though it's a convention, we're explicit about it. There is an RFC or a standard somewhere that determines what those conventions actually are. So if we're explicit about our conventions, we can have a convention-driven approach but still manage to be explicit about it. And so this is kind of the way that I tend to think about media types and the way that we are building APIs now. Um, because everything that we do is based on, is not based on conventions right now. Um, so uh, yeah, so they're explicit because we mention specifically what the content type, how you process the content type in an RFC. Um, and they're conventions because we have some sort of shared understanding about what's going on. Um, OK. so. Uh, to talk about the way that we're building APIs today and why we're not following conventions and how unfortunate that is, um, let's talk about application JSON. So this is from the JSON RFC, and it says that JavaScript object notation is a lightweight format for giving you the structure of your data. Um, and so what's interesting about this is that lightweight word, right? So everybody loves JSON because it is mega lightweight, but the problem is, is that it doesn't actually say anything, right? So uh, the problem with JSON is that while the minimalism is awesome, uh, we need more semantics than the minimalism that JSON provides in order to model your API, right? So uh, in a world where you actually followed the content type and only the content type, you would be able to look at the spec for that type and implement the API off of it. But looking at the JSON RFC is not enough to implement a client for your API. You've layered extra semantics on top of JSON that are special and custom for your API. So I've been jokingly, I just spent two weeks in Brooklyn, so I've been jokingly calling these like bespoke artisan handcrafted APIs is what we're all doing right now. Like everyone is building their own custom JSON format and instead of like registering them somewhere as like a custom JSON format, they'd basically just say like, oh yeah, it's JSON plus this is my key structure and here's how I do like embedded resources and here's how all these other things happen. Um, and so they're totally and completely unique, even though most of the tasks that we want to do in an API um, is very similar, right? So. Uh, not every API is identical, but like most APIs need to deal with pagination, for example. Most APIs need to deal with authentication in some way, although it should be handled at the HTTP layer and not in the JSON layer. Um, you know, there, there are a large amount of shared tasks that every API needs, yet we constantly custom reinvent the wheel for every single API, and they're all different. So we can't take advantage of reusable and maintainable tools because we need to recode a client for every single different API. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the purpose of a media type is to give you all of the processing rules because that's how, uh, that's how this, this process scales. So for example, um, it's totally normal in our universe that when you release a new version of the API, you need to write a new client, right? Like it's not unusual to any of you. You would nod your heads if I say that's the state of the world. But if I told you that you needed to update your web browser whenever Google deployed a new version of google.com, you would think that that's ridiculous. Um, but it's the same thing in a different context. So 
uh, we don't need to update our web browsers every time we deploy a new version of our website because the web browser follows the processing rules of the media type, in this case being HTML, and the producing computer pr follows the rules of the media type, in this case HTML. So since they have this shared understanding, uh, you can change things on one side, and since the intermediate layer, the message layer, is identical, you don't need to actually update the client. And you can make it do new interesting behaviors solely based on the way that we fiddle around with stuff, right? Like we we mostly are, are like programming our web browsers from the server side because we inject behaviors in through HTML. So we're not taking any advantage of this today in API clients for the most part whatsoever. Um, and that's really unfortunate because it would be nice if we did not have to totally rewrite completely custom clients every time. It would be nice if we did not have to completely redo the work every time a new version of the API comes out. It would be nice if to use multiple APIs we did not need to have a totally custom script every single time. Um, so I, I've also been saying that like every sufficiently advanced API contains an ad hoc informally specified implementation of some media type on top of JSON uh, because you know we don't think through all of these implications and we don't like publish them anywhere. Um, also, here's the other thing, and I think this is a bigger problem than like the theory of types and reusability, which I think is important, but I'm not sure we are all ready for that future yet. I think that's a couple years out. The important one is bike shedding. So. I don't know about you all, but I really like to argue on the internet. Um, I, get, I get mad like at least three times a day at somebody on Twitter, right? So the problem, the real problem with application JSON is because there is no shared understanding of how you should structure the content inside of your JSON, this leads to hours and hours of programmer time lost because you're arguing over, are keys plural or are they singular? Is there like a nesting that's involved? Where does metadata go? And you have to make this argument every single time you want to build a new API. We re-argue all these conventions. Like, oh, is this, is this namespace somehow? Is this wrapped in some place? What do my URLs look like? Should I be using post or should I be using put? Like, is it, what about this patch thing? Like, you need to totally, and, and you know, we love to waste time and argue about irrelevant details, so we do this all the time, and it's like fun, but at the same time, it's not very productive. So uh, yeah, bike shedding leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. Um, so the solution is, of course, to develop another standard. Um, so uh, I have this standard called JSON API. You can go check out at jsonapi.org. Um, and I would like to tell you how it can solve most of these problems. Um, so to give you a little bit of history um, and information about like what this particular format does, um, JSON API uh, assumes that you have some sort of data that you would like to synchronize over the network. So almost every client that you build, at least in the current style, is you know uh, if I'm building a blog, I have posts and comments, right? So on my server side, I have posts and I have comments. I expose them somehow in JSON, and I want my API client to be able to consume posts and comments. So you build something where you build objects that are based off the data you transfer over the wire, right? Like this is pretty much the standard way that most RESTful API clients are built. So assuming that kind of use case, um, we want to give you the ability to build a smart client that can minimize requests as much as possible and possibly even totally ignore them. So you can think of it as almost like a data store um, on the client side that knows how to fetch things it does not know about. Um, so that's sort of the reason that this thing exists. Um, so this is actually based on real code that has been deployed and has been put into production in a number of places. Um, it actually came out of, so myself and Yehuda Katz, uh, other Rails team member and uh, you know, Ember JS creator, um, we like to argue with each other, sometimes on the internet, sometimes in person, a lot. And so we were talking about how to get Ember and Rails to play nicely together. And he's like, I don't want Ember to be just a Rails thing. I want it to be for any server-side framework. So I was like, oh, well, that means you need to standardize on this format. Like, what is your data adapter going to expect? So we started working on the conventions we would like to see in APIs and then built um, Ember data to expect those conventions and active model serializers to produce those conventions. And then instead of just saying, use these two bits of software, we decided to write up what that JSON looks like and what HTTP calls it expects and all that kind of stuff into a shared document so that other people could implement other bits of software if they don't like it. So um, for example, uh, there are now three or four different Ruby gems that know how to expose this format. So if you don't like the way that we built active model serializers, you can go use um, REST pack for example, um, and now you have this choice. And so REST pack plays just as nicely with an Ember app as the official client does because we've standardized in this intermediate format. Um, 
So I am now, uh, I just finally took a job. I've been a lazy jobless bum for the last two months because um, I was like looking for a good fit for a job. And so um, I'm now working at Balanced Payments, which is a payments company in the United States. Uh, we only handle US stuff because that's why every payments company works. So eventually we want to move to Europe, but you know, regulations and stuff, money is hard. But the point is, is that we, um, they were actually using the standard before I signed on. That's one of the reasons why I joined this particular company is because they were implementing my spec and uh, they basically gave me the opportunity of like hey Steve you're always talking about theory this is an opportunity for you to actually also build out the practice and so uh, we deployed the new version that uses this on the my first day last week but they've been beta testing this with one particular customer that has done you know X zillion dollars of transactions in the last couple months so this API format is good enough for handling money so it's probably good enough for handling your use case as well um, I guess is what I would say. So, um, and also, like, while this may seem a little bit of academic nonsense because that's how I like to talk, um, it is based in real running code with real APIs that already exist. Um, okay, so what does it actually look like? Enough about all this, like, abstract whatever. Um, what does this actually mean? So, uh, there is, the spec is a teeny little bit schizophrenic in that there are two sort of styles. One is a hypermedia enabled style, and one is a more traditional RESTy ID number style. So, this is an example, that's a little small. I always, let me see if this actually gets bigger. Oh, I don't even know, it's a keyboard. Cool, yeah, the web. It doesn't actually, <laughs> doesn't actually make them smaller. So, um, so basically this is an example of like blog posts, right? So this has a key at the top level, it says posts with a JSON array, and it has an ID of one, a title, um, and then uh, links to the author of that post and related comments. Um, if you wanted to use the hypermedia enabled style, um, this is the way that that would look. So almost the same structure, except for that ID should actually be URL to, um, I messed up my slide. But uh, the ID should also be a link, and the author and comments um, are links instead of just ID numbers. So you can see this is nothing super ridiculously foreign, right? Like this is sort of how you might do it, but there's lots of stuff that we've made decisions for you where you don't have to worry about it. So it is posts, the plural of the word post, for example. Um, there is a, only three reserved attributes, so there are four reserved attributes. So there's the ID, um, the links attribute, and uh, meta, and one other one that I can't remember off the top of my head, and the rest of it is all just the data. So like there is the ability to insert metadata. Um, it is not just for read stuff. Yeah, so we use URI templates, for example. Um, so we tried to build off of existing specifications as much as possible. So this builds on top of the JSON RFC, the URI template RFC, the patch RFC, the J, uh, JSON patch RFC, um, all of these different standards that already exist. So if you did not want to, for example, put those long links everywhere, you can use URI templates. So this shows that for the comments on posts, um, it takes the form of example.com post post ID comments, and then you can use the ID um, of that section to you know, figure out what the URLs are, um, et cetera. So um, this is nothing super scary, but the point is when we all share these conventions, we can build reusable tooling. Um, so uh, also it is not just for get requests. So for example, if we fetched um, a particular uh, you know, JSON API server and it gave us back this photos array with one, you know, one photo in it, we could then send a uh, post request to the URL that is embedded like the, uh, in that uh, response and provide data in this sort of format and that would then, you know, we could get the collection again and it would return this stuff. So this is nothing that is foreign, but the point is that it is spelled out so that everyone does it in the exact same way. We do not like tweak it um, in totally different ways for every single different API that exists. Um, so we tried to build on what people already know. This is not like throwing out everything that you know. It's just writing down what we know. So instead of you having to ask uh, the other people on your team how it works, you can just go look at the specification. Um, so. Uh, there's some other examples. I totally forget how much time I have. It is, I think I have enough time to look at a couple of these. Let's bust these out real quick here. Uh, yeah, all right, sweet. So this is someone, um, the person who makes the REST pack um, exposed the sample um, API of theirs. So for example, um, this, is a, uh, this is an API that provides recording artists and their albums. So. Uh, if you wanted to look at, uh, I guess this is not pretty printed in this browser, so this is actually kind of awkward, but the point is is that uh, you would get lists of artists and they would return these things. 
Yeah, without the pretty printing, this is kind of awkward. Um, there's support for side loading. So we have the ability to demonstrate, like if you have related resources and you'd like to request that they come back in the same response, so you do not need to make multiple responses for every single item that you have. Um, there's side loading support. So this would include their albums, for example. So now you can see this response is bigger. Um, again, sorry for the lack of pretty printing, change browsers. Um, but this now includes the, the same artist information as before, but also includes their albums information in line. Um, and uh, yeah, so you could just like do all sorts of things to return more data based on whatever it, thing it is that you're trying to fetch. Um, so you can go check out those links too. Let's see if I can, yeah, cool. Um, okay, so anyway, as a summary for all of this, uh, media types are about explicitly defining conventions um, between developers. Uh, conventions improve our productivity because they reduce the amount of bike shedding that we have to deal with because we agree on some sort of shared understanding. They also help us scale to organizations that are bigger than our own because when you're producing an API, the people that are consuming it are not in your office. So getting in touch with them is complicated and costly, right? Like asynchronous communication scales better than synchronous communication. So having them written out helps. Um, also, conventions pave the path for reusability because we can build reusable tooling. So um, it does not matter what server-side version of things you use to implement this, you can use Ember data with any of them. And it does not matter if you don't want to use Ember data, you can use any of the client-side ones. There are a couple in development, although Ember data is the only like JavaScript client. There are also some Ruby clients being developed and some other people are working on some stuff. But the point is you can mix and match whatever tools you feel are appropriate because the message format is standardized. Um, you should pick some sort of media type that fits your application. There are applications that are not trying to synchronize objects over the network, um, and so they would be inappropriate for this type. They might want to use, for example, HAL or Collection JSON or Siren or any of the other kinds of media types that people are inventing and using. Um, or you may want to divide, divide, develop a totally custom one for your application if you do not want to uh, you know, use something that is used by everyone. Um, and then if you're not sure, you should check out JSON API um, because I'm very interested in uh, what people have to say and the experiences people have like actually using this. So um, that is all I have for you uh, as far as slides go at least. You can, yeah, like I said, you can check out the spec there. There's a link to GitHub. So we do all, um, even though it's co-authored by Yehuda and myself, we um, specifically like take feedback from everyone. So the specification is on GitHub. You can submit pull requests to edit it if you want to add and improve features. We're currently discussing how to do a whole bunch of things um, right now. So uh, I would love for you to check it out, get involved. We prioritize running code over theory. So if someone shows like, hey, my change to the spec makes coding the client or server easier because of X, we say cool as opposed to, I read this academic paper and I think that it should maybe work like this. Um, so uh, we really prioritize implementers. So, um, all right, thanks. So if you have any questions, Steve is only in Paris five times a year. <laughs> yeah, only, only that often. So if you have any question, if you're on the balcony, you can shout and, and you will repeat the question. Yeah. yeah it's okay. And then I can ask two questions there. Hi again. So, um, is there any way JSONAPI.org could turn in a sort of uh, JSON model store? Yeah, that, that's, that's, yes. That is another way of phrasing the like synchronizing data, right? So it's about, uh, like the Ember data literally is ds.store, right? It is a model store. Um, so, so we could have models for different use case. I want to talk about this kind of thing, so my data will look like this or something right. like that. Yes. Oh, you mean like a like an iTunes store store, not like a repository pattern store? A pattern store. Okay, yes. Yeah. Totally. We have a question there. And if Adam Clement can begin to put his uh, computer. Hi. Um, what is your opinion on the, the semantic web in general and JSON LD particularly? Totally. So um it depends on how harsh I want to be on a given day, and I would like to not be super harsh. So I will say that uh, I think that the semantic web is an interesting idea that has not borne any particularly useful fruit yet. And it may still do so, but I am not convinced by what currently exists. 
So I think that JSON-LD is a spec that is interesting, but is very verbose, and I'm not sure of the like value that it gives um, in response. So uh, I am I am waiting to see how it shakes out, and I hope that the people that are working on it are like you know they are still working on it, right? The W3C has been really interested in the semantic web as of late. So, so earlier today we were discussing kind of this idea of the of the uh, semantic web, and Christian was saying that the poor man's semantic web is linked data. What do you think of linked data as an alternative? Or is it something that coexists with semantic? Uh, so th it's sort of like I, I am not well versed enough in the details between like the full blown semantic web and linked data and all of like Sparkle and all of the different particular formats. They're sort of, from my perspective, they're all kind of in the same space. So I can't give you an answer that is like intelligent. Basically, I would just make something up. Um, so I will not make something up and tell you I have no idea. Um, yeah. Any other question? So balcony stay quiet. So thank Thanks. you, Steve. Thank you so much.